Our final scientist tonight is Karina Tarnita. She's a junior fellow in the Harvard Society of Fellows, an affiliate of the Department of Mathematics and of the Program for Evolutionary Dynamics at Harvard. Fittingly, Karina applies mathematics to study evolution and evolutionary dynamics. Please help me welcome Karina Tarnita to the stage. Good evening. Thank you. Um, so when I first talked to Amy, the wonderful producer of the Spotlight, um, I thought it would be an easy job. I just, I'll just give the talk that I always give. But then she explained it has to be about women in science. And as Joy said, I find that a bit terrifying. Um, so five weeks later and uh, a million phone calls later, this is what I came up with. So um, I realized, so she wanted me not only to talk about my work, but about how my being a woman defines the work that I do or the experience of doing it. And I realized I hadn't actually asked myself this question. So this was a great opportunity for me to just think about my relationship with math throughout the years. Um, and I realized my first exposure with math came at around the age of three, uh, when my mother, who is in the audience tonight and is a university professor of mechanical engineering, was sitting pretty much every daily situation in terms of some mathematical puzzle. So imagine me at three, um, hungry, <laughs> asking for an apple, and my mother saying, um, OK, you can have one, but imagine I have three apples and I give you one. How many do I have left? <laughs> yeah. Um, I turned out to be good at solving them, if only to get some food, but um, <laughs> I wasn't particularly thrilled about having to solve a linear equation every time I asked for an apple, mom. <laughs> also, um, at the same time, I was being raised on this small farm in southern Romania by my paternal grandparents. And my child assessment of what was going on on the farm was that my grandmother was in charge of the finances and she decided what to spend, how much on what and when to buy it, whereas my grandfather was in charge of the people who were helping on the farm. So you see, I kind of grew up thinking it was the women who were doing the math and dealing with the numbers, and it was the men who were doing the more human-related jobs. So, for example, my father, who's also here tonight, is an orthopedic surgeon. And so the fact that I turned out to be somewhat good at math uh, seemed more like the standard than the exception for a very long part of my life. It was only at around the age of 13 when I um, started to go to math contests and math olympiads that I realized that the ratio of girls to boys was 1 to 15 or 1 to 20. It's just that by that time, math had become so familiar that I never really um, doubted my desire or my ability to do it. And to the great credit of my teachers, neither did they. I also never really asked myself why there are so few women doing math. Um, perhaps also because of the young age, but also because none of my girlfriends seemed to envy me for it. In fact, <laughs> most of them kept constantly telling me that I'm kind of weird for wanting to do something that had absolutely no appeal to them. So it was only when I came to Harvard as an undergrad um, that I became aware of the whole women in science issue. In uh, high school in Romania, my math teacher was a remarkable woman and we had a wonderful relationship. And yet at Harvard, in my many years at Harvard, I never, none of the math courses that I took was taught by a woman. Also, um, when I was accepted for PhD in math at Harvard, I was one of two women out of 12 incoming students. And to top it all, the Harvard math department had never tenured a woman until last year. And Everyone around me was talking about the issue of women in science, um, how women are positioned in academia. And I distinctly remember that upon getting accepted into the Harvard Society of Fellows, as again one of two women out of, two, out of 12 incoming junior fellows, I was told by at least five former junior fellows that there was a time when women weren't allowed into the society. So this was interesting for me to hear it over and over, especially since not only was I not one of the first women in the Society of Fellows, but I wasn't even the first Romanian woman. Nevertheless, the fact that such a time existed, as, as uh, Jean also mentioned it, um, was still a reality in the minds of many. And one of these people was E.O. Wilson. Um, 
E.O. Wilson, if you don't know of him, you should. He is amazing. He is um, probably the greatest naturalist of our time, a conservationist, uh, defender of biodiversity, and above all, the greatest living student of the ants. So I met Ed Wilson in 2009, when he and my PhD advisor and mentor, a great mathematical biologist at Harvard, Martin Novak, started a collaboration. So Ed called Martin one day and he said he needed the help of a mathematician because he felt that after studying ants for 60 years, he needed math to shed light on phenomena that had been puzzling him for decades. He felt that without mathematics, any other explanation would be a just-so story. So I was brought on the project as the mathematician, and I knew nothing about the real world, um, but I learned from Ed Wilson at least about ants, and here I spent countless hours in his office listening to him talk about his beloved ants in his gentle southern manner, and I can tell you that meeting Ed Wilson changed my life because it made me look at one of the most common, and I thought one of the most boring insects out there, as a wonder. And seriously, this sounds a bit cheesy, but this realization made me look at life differently. So let me tell you a little bit about what I learned about ants. There are multiple roles in an ant colony. This is the queen um, and some of her daughters. The queen is probably the most prominent role. She lays all the eggs. This is the only thing she does in the colony. She is much bigger than her daughters, as you can see. She also lives much longer. She lives for 20 or 30 years um, in certain cases, whereas her worker daughters live for only three to six months on average. Um, she mates only once in her lifetime, but stores inside her abdomen enough sperm to maintain a colony of roughly five million individuals at any one time for 30 years. Um, then she, um, so this is the queen. When the queen dies, the whole colony dies with it. So they have not found a way to just get a new queen. The whole colony dies the moment the queen dies. The next category are the workers, not the winged one. Everything else is a worker. Um, the workers are smaller in size, but they come in different sizes and shapes depending on the varied types of work that they have to do, whether they are foragers or whether they are soldiers or uh, whether they tend to the larvae or have to go out of the uh, colony. Uh, the most important thing about the workers is that they do not reproduce. They are completely sterile. So they are meant only to help their mother raise more offspring. Um, the third category are the virgin queens, which you can see here. The virgin queen um, is fed a different type of food. It grows wings. It has no role in the colony. It doesn't, it doesn't participate with the life of the colony. It just waits around until mating time comes and then flies out of the colony, mates, and goes to start her own, um, her own colony. Um, finally, we have the males. Um, here you see them in their nuptial flight, serenely waiting for their women. Uh, sorry, virgin queens. Um, and um, the males are very short-lived. They live for only two to three weeks. They don't participate in the life of the colony. They don't actually do anything. They can't even feed themselves, so they are... <laughs> there are many women in this audience. <laughs> Um, they uh, actually, <laughs> they're fed by their worker sisters. Um, and they just wait until mating comes and then they mate and then they die because uh, they can't feed themselves and they're not, they, they can't come back to the colony. Um, actually, Ed Wilson describes them as having huge eyes, huge genitalia, and not being good for anything else but mating, so he calls them sperm missiles. So after mating, one of these virgin queens goes off and starts her own colony. It's extremely lonely at the beginning of a life of a colony. It's just one virgin queen and its first eggs. So she finds one spot, one hole, and she starts a colony there. But the dangers are huge and they come from all over the place, not least of all from other ants. Ants are extremely territorial and would kill anything that is outside of their colony. So. Um, it's not a surprise that actually one in 10,000 virgin queens makes it. So only one in 10,000 manages to start its own colony. Um, just to show you a bit of the cool things that ants manage to do, their life is extremely sophisticated. These are leafcutter ants. They go, cut, 
leaves. Um, the small one up there that seems to be hitching a ride is actually has a very important role. She just looks in the air and sees if there are any predators so she can alert her sisters if there's anything wrong. The, the bigger ones are, are the ones that actually cut the leaves. Then they bring them back to the colony, but not in order to eat them but in order to feed them to the fungi gardens. It turns out that ants have discovered agriculture much, much, much before us. And um, it's the fungus that they actually eat, and the leaves are just meant there to feed the fungus. Um, we also have soldier casts. These are valiant little ants that will attack anything anything, regardless of size, they attack elephants, believe me, and it's nothing more impressive than seeing like a four or five ton elephant running for its life because a few thousand ants are just stinging it. <laughs> and they've also managed to domesticate animals. So here are some aphids that are feeding on this plant, and the ants are actually tending to this herd of aphids. The, uh, they're protecting them from predators, and in exchange, the aphids let the ants milk them, they give them some honeydew, which then the ants eat. So if you want, the aphids are like the cows of the ants. So ants are extremely, sorry, that was wrong. Um, so ants are extremely sophisticated. They have a social behavior, which is very interesting. It's not the usual social behavior that you see in a pack of wolves hunting together. It's more sophisticated, well, it's, it's different from that. So that's why E.O. Wilson called them eusocial, because not only do they have a division of, of labor, but they also have a division of reproduction. They have one queen that reproduces, and a million or millions of sterile workers that help her reproduce. So there are other species that have it. There are uh, wasps and termites and bees and a few other things. But actually, they are very, very few. Only 2% of all insect, of all 900,000 known insect species have, use, have found eusociality. Uh, but if you weigh them, so if you weigh their biomass, they turn out to account for more than 50% of that of all insects out there. So once you have it, it's extremely successful. And perhaps even more strikingly, if you just take all the ants and you weigh them, and you compare that to the entire biomass of all vertebrates, so you put in there tigers and lions and people and everything that's vertebrate, it, the ants outweigh us three times. So the question is, if you sociality is such a great thing, why has it arisen so few times? Why have so few species found it? So this is what we set out to model and to understand mathematically. And it turns out that you sociality requires a lot of uh, phenomena to occur at the same time, uh, environmental and genetic. And these, are, these have very low probability of occurring. But what we found was even more interesting than that. We found that you sociality is not it's very different from social behavior. So in social behavior, you have individuals, independent individuals that come together to work cooperatively to solve some sort of task. Um, in you sociality, you have one individual, the queen, that then reproduces and builds these workers that then help her reproduce more. So it seems to be different. It seems that you sociality is like a new way of reproduction, one where you discover that you can grow a big body and then you can reproduce once you are sufficiently big that you can defend yourself better. So in some sense, you sociality, uh, and this confirmed what, he, what Ed Wilson had always believed, that an ant colony is like an organism where you have the germ line is the queen and the soma cells are the, the ants. So um, maybe it won't surprise you then if I tell you that if we count the number of times you sociality has originated and the number of times complex multicellularity like plants and animals and so on has originated, they are the same order of magnitude. So in some sense, you sociality is just finding a new way to reproduce. And in the process of understanding that, we also realized something surprising. Since Darwin, people have been, have been puzzled by the behavior of worker ants. Here you have these organisms that choose not to reproduce, but in fact to help someone else reproduce. Why would that make sense? They are remarkable altruists, and they were seen like the ultimate cooperators. But when we wrote down the equations for you sociality, we actually realized that they are not equations of cooperation and defection. If the worker ants are these amazing cooperators, 
who are the defectors, who are the free riders here. The free riders would have to be those who, instead of helping their mother, would just go out to seek their own reproduction, so they would be the virgin queens. But what we immediately realized in our model was that you actually, for your sociality, you need both. You need both the daughters that stay and the daughters that go. The daughters that stay are important to build the colony and to make it strong and to defend it, but the daughters that go are the ones that carry the genes forward. Because if a, if a colony grows huge, it still nevertheless just lives as long as the queen lives. When the queen dies, all the genes of that colony die with it. So you need something that takes the genes forward into the next generation. So we realized that both of these daughters are essential, and that's actually another very important one of these events that has to happen to get you sociality. You need the right proportion of daughters that stay and the right proportion of daughters that go. So this is, um, we kind of demystified this idea of this extreme altruism and um, ultimate cooperation by realizing that actually you sociality is not a matter of cooperation and defection, it's actually inventing a new way of reproduction. And so the analysis of this mathematical model filled about 50 pages uh, of dense mathematics. So uh, it was tricky to present it to Ed Wilson. So I gave a high level overview, you know, and he seemed happy with the level of detail that I had provided. He seemed happy with the, with the results. Um, but then a few days later, I get a phone call bright and early at 6 a.m. from Ed Wilson, who sounded cheerful on the other um, end of the line, saying, I've been reading the detailed analysis of your model. I'm like, what? That was, for, that was intended for theoreticians. I didn't even expect you to, to open the file. He's like, yeah, yeah, I've been reading it, and I actually think I can understand parts of it, but I'd like you to walk me through it. <laughs> okay. The fact that at 81, the man who started more fields than most um, wanted to learn mathematics was a surprise, but the fact that I would have to explain it to him was just unbelievable. And it was a wonderful experience, and I didn't think about it then in the context of women in science, but when I look at it in retrospect, I see it as proof that although there's still a lot to be done and a lot more to go, um, the, the scientific world has come a long way from the days that Jean was talking about when women were not allowed in Lamont Library or into the Society of Fellows. Um, and I view my interaction with Ed as a reinforcement of, the, I, of, of something I always thought or at least hoped for, that there are people out there who just want the best person for the job. Thank you very much.